you. Uh, thank you, my teachers and uh, Dr. Basu. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Srinanjan Basu as well for this invitation. Uh, now that uh, we have uh, done some motion management strategies, contoured, uh, approved the plan, and the treatment delivery is over, now it's time for your follow up uh, evaluation after delivering SBRT. So I'll be tackling both follow-up imaging as well as uh, post sbrt toxicity. Uh, let's begin with follow-up imaging. So in the next, say, 10 odd minutes, I would like to address these questions. Why do you need an imaging? What do we usually come across when we uh, look at the follow-up imaging? What do we expect? Which uh, imaging modality would we prefer? when to do the imaging and how to interpret the imaging and how to differentiate between a post RT change vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your uh, local recurrence. So why is pretty obvious? You need to assess the tumor response after you deliver treatment. You may detect uh, local regional or distant recurrences and occasionally you may come across a second primary. Now, You've seen in the previous lectures that with SBRT, you achieve excellent local controls in the region of 90%, but still one out of 10 patients will have a local failure. Now, local recurrence in an SBRT setting is defined as within the target volume, which is infill recurrence, adjacent to the target volume, which is your marginal recurrence, or within the involved lobe of the lung. Now, there are a few factors which we must keep in mind, which are associated with a higher risk of local recurrence. Some clinical factors like larger tumors, squamous carcinomas, higher pretreatment SUV max values. As uh, Moses has already previously mentioned, there are lower BD less than 100 tend to have increased uh, risk of local failure. So while you're interpreting your follow-up imaging, keep these in mind. And majority recurrences occur in the first two years but late recurrences do happen, which will have uh, a bearing on your surveillance strategy. Now, what happens when you deliver such high doses in such small number of fractions? The spectrum of post-treatment changes to the lung parenchyma. Now, the nomenclature is mostly dependent on the time. So what you see within the first six months, that is the acute phase, we call it radiation pneumonitis. Beyond six months, we call it a radiation fibrosis, the late changes. The median time to appearance of these, if you see, is around 17 weeks. Compare this with your conventional fractionation, it is around four to five weeks only. Pneumonitis can be either a subclinical, which is mostly radiological changes, or it can be clinical. We'll come to it later on. Diagnosing clinical pneumonitis is very challenging. There are a number of differential diagnoses which may confuse, like an acute acceleration of COPD or your interstitial lung disease. You can have pneumonia or you can have a disease progression which may appear like uh, pneumonitic changes. The incidence of symptomatic uh, pneumonitis after SBRT is around say 9 to 10% based on the uh, existing literature. Some studies do uh, report a higher uh, toxicities depending on the location and the doses prescribed. However, if you look at this risk of severe uh, radiation pneumonitis, which is grade three or more, is pretty low. Uh, based on this paper by Ikazo et al., uh, acute uh, lung changes are, there's a four CT patterns of early radiation pneumonitis, grossly two types a consolidation or a ground glass opacity, and each can again be divided into either a patchy or a diffuse. Now, what's the difference between a ground glass opacity and a consolidation? So both are opacifications of the lung parenchyma, but in ground glass opacity, you can still make out the bronchovascular markings, which will be obliterated in a consolidation. And patchy means it is the diameter is around less than five centimeters. Anything more than five is considered as diffuse or if the changes uh, cover uh, more than 50% of your radiation field. In addition, you may come across pleural thickenings or reactive effusions, but usually they are very small. They 
remain stable for a very long period. They usually don't decrease and they dissolve spontaneously. Patients having underlying pulmonary disease can have extensive pneumonitic changes way going beyond your, uh, the radiation fields or your high dose regions. Let's have a look at these images to have some idea. So on the left side, uh, uh, the image is, is just follow the red marks, which I've highlighted for a better understanding. So this was a tumor post uh, SBRT. What you find is these uh, haziness around this high dose volume, but you can still make out the bronchovascular markings. So this is a typical diffuse ground glass opacity. Compare this with this, where there is a complete obliteration in some areas, which is considered as a diffuse consolidation because a large part of my uh, field is now obliterated. However, smaller area of haziness is we consider as a patchy ground glass opacity. Again, uh, in this case, on the right hand side, if you see the right side, the right arrow marks the area of patchy consolidation, whereas the orange arrow marks area of patchy ground glass opacity. Now, these are the acute changes. What about the late changes is what is called the radiation fibrosis patterns. Again, uh, Kinnick et al. Again, these changes are mostly coming from the conventional fraction, but they're still used for uh, SBRT setting with respect to the uh, radiological appearance. Mostly three patterns of fibrosis that we see. One is the modified conventional fibrosis. The other is a scar-like fibrosis. The third is, is the mass-like fibrosis, which is the most confusing uh, when you're uh, trying to find out whether this is a local recurrence or only a benign fibrosis. Let's have a look at each one of them. So on the left-hand side, again, you see there was a tumor with the red arrow, I mean, red line is the, the high dose isolose lines. So when you have your uh, consolidation in and around the high dose region, which is associated with a well-defined consolidation with volume loss, and you may have a traction bronchiectasis. That is this dilatation of the bronchioles. That is called as traction bronchiectasis. These changes are associated with the modified conventional fibrosis. This is the most common pattern that we come across almost in 50 to 60% of the cases. Another picture showing the same thing, the tumor which was treated with SBRT, first uh, three month scan showing both your ground glass opacity as well as consolidation. However, a longer follow-up, so post SBRT scan done after one year, this shows this modified conventional fibrosis with your dilated bronchioles. What is a scar-like fibrosis? Is your linear opacity in the region of the tumor. So in the high dose region, on the right hand side, you see all of those red arrows, you see those scar-like bands. This is again seen in around 50 to 20% of the cases. This is what is really important, is the mass-like fibrosis. This uh, is defined as a well-defined uh, fibrotic pattern around your target volume. So it kind of conforms to the target volume. So just imagine a tumor, imagine a two centimeter circumferential margin around the tumor. So when you see fibrotic changes in and around that region, conforming to that shape, conforming to that high dose, isodose volume is where you find your uh, mass like fibrotic patterns. And to add on to this confusion, what you have is the evolution of your post SBRT fibrosis. So a patient after having treated with SBRT, six months down the line, you take a scan or say 12 months down the line, you take a scan and you find a modified conventional fibrosis, keep the patient under follow-up, repeat a scan after two years, you may find that conventional fibrosis converting into a mass-like fibrosis. That does not necessarily mean that the patient is having a local recurrence. Again, similar changes on the left-hand side, this was a modified conventional fibrosis, Longer follow-up, looks like a mass-like fibrosis. A similar a PET CT done in the same setting shows there is no focal uptake. Uh, how to distinguish between a lung injury versus a local recurrence? See, misclassification of a lung injury vis-a-vis -vis a local recurrence is a double-edged sword. If you misclassify a recurrence, you miss a chance of a potential salvage. If you, if you 
brand something as a local recurrence while it was a fibrosis, you end up doing futile investigations, futile surgeries. Commonly for solid tumors, we use RESIST 1.1 for uh, response assessment. But unfortunately, response assessment, RESIST 1.1 is not really very useful. Why? I'll just give you an example. Tumor here in the right upper lobe, the red uh, line is the uh, higher isodose lines. The prescription dose, uh, isodose, the yellow and the orange are the 50%, 25% isodose lines. At three months, you see a large in area a volume higher or larger than the tumor is now showing some opacity. Longer follow-up changes into a scar-like fibrosis. So your racist would have branded this as a progressive disease. However, it was only post RT changes. So how to deal with that? Well, uh, the Huang et al. He came up with a systematic review of post RT uh, uh, radiological appearances, and they came up with this list of seven features which are suggestive of a high risk of recurrence, which includes enlarging opacity of the tumor site on serial follow-up, uh, there's loss of linear margin, convex bulging margins. I'll come to each and one of them. I'll show you, give you examples to have a better understanding. Loss of air bronchograms, what it actually means, enlarging opacity at after one year of treatment, and very important, this was one of the most important uh, indicators of local radicals was a craniocaudal growth, more than five millimeters or more than 20% of your baseline tumor size. Uh, in 2018, the who's who of lung SBRT met together with a consensus statement, the international Delphi consensus, which said that you suspect a local recurrence if you have these features. So if there's an infiltration into the adjacent organs or structures, a sustained growth over serial scans, you have a bulgy margin, a mass-like growth, or a predominantly spherical growth, increase in the craniocaudal dimension, or the loss of air bronchograms. This is pretty self-explanatory, serially enlarging opacity. Loss of the linear margin. You see this linear margin, just follow the red arrow, and you see this, this bulging margin there. You suspect a local recurrence there. Again, look at this area just adjacent to the uh, trachea. You now see there is this predominantly spherical growth with a bulging convex margin. Again, suspect a local recurrence. Uh, so loss of air bronchograms. So normally this air filled uh, spaces, if they get obliterated or a longer or a uh, further uh, uh, scans, that should be suspected as one of the higher risk predictors of local recurrence. Again, and two minutes. Okay, sir. Uh, so again, this typical example of a craniocaudal growth, and you can see the bulging convex margins, the orange arrow. Just one example. So look like a fibrosis followed up. You see increase in opacity serially with convex uh, bulging margins. Our corresponding opacity showed uh, uh, presence of a local recurrence. What about the role of functional imaging? PET gives you added information. It can help you guide in biopsies, pick up regional or distant meds. But uh, it is useful in patients where you are suspected recurrence on a CT. The problem is the risk of false positive. You have a better specificity when you do it beyond six months. However, what is the usefulness is a high negative predictive value. Functional MRIs are now being tried. Uh, just give one example where PET CT is useful. Is this those look like a fibrotic pattern with a PET CT? This can now guide you to take a biopsy to prove local recurrence. Well, I'm not going to radio mix. There's a separate session for that. Uh, radio mix is coming up in a big way to pick up early recurrences than what the human eye can comprehend. So what the Delphi consensus said that you do your imaging routinely with CT scans at three months and not at six weeks. Follow it up at six and 12 months in the first year, followed by 18 and 24 months in the second year. From there on, annually scans. They even suggest, uh, suggested doing surveillance even after five years. There was no consensus regarding the frequency. And a judicious use of PET is recommended. Do it only when you suspect a local recurrence. Uh, there's an algorithm there available on uh, when to do uh, uh, further studies. So, my take so, why is quite obvious. For what get acquainted with the acute and uh, late changes 
preferably get a CT scan done at CT only when you suspect recurrences, when to do at three months, and how to is look for the high risk features. Do I have a minute for toxicity or no? Um, organizer, we still have questions. Should can we take the questions now or would in the with the panel discussion? Do we go? So give him one more minute. Okay. I'll just quickly run through the toxicities. Again, most of it has already discussed. So the important OARs you have is lung, chest wall, the heart, the airways. Uh, with respect to lung, radiation pneumonitis is one of the most common. Be very, very careful. A uh, few biomarkers are available, but they're not validated for clinical use. Factors predicting pneumonitis, these older patients, those having underlying lung disease, large tumors, central tumors, mid and lower lobe tumors, they tend to have higher risk and your treatment related to some uh, dosimetric parameters can predict higher risk of local recurrences. Heart toxicity will not very well understood as uh, is available for conventional fractionation, but there are some parameters people looking into the substructure doses, which may give you a better prediction. Uh, Major vessels, which include pulmonary vessels, the aorta, the supra vena cava. So again, high dose per fraction, higher risk of toxicity. Central airway is very, very important when you're treating your central and ultracentral tumors. The risk is higher in the lower and the segmental bronchi and less in the mid and the mid uh, the mainstem bronchi. Esophagus ranges from mild esophagitis to life threatening strictures, perforations, and fistulas. Again, higher risk with higher dose per fraction. Rib fracture, again, very, very careful for peripheral tumors, which are closer to the uh, chest wall. Again, higher risk when you are uh, delivering, the max doses are very high for your ribs. Brachial plexus, uh, Madam has very well delineated how to delineate your brachial plexus. Again, increases when your Dmax is higher. Very, be very careful when you're treating tumors in the apex for avoiding brachial plexopathy. My take, Higher risk with high dose per fraction, especially for central tumors. In challenging cases, when you're not able to meet your dose constraints, use protracted regimens and reduce your dose per fraction. You have ex existing trial protocols. The several activity protocols will guide you about your dose constraints. And we need studies in biomarkers to better tailor your SBRT treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sian. It was a nice uh, lecture. Now we are almost half an hour late. So we'll have the question as uh, Tarinjana has told that during the panel discussion, we'll have the question. Keep your questions ready. And we invite Dr. Naveen uh, Mahmoudi. Uh, he's associate professor in radiation oncology and also the secretary.